Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you so very much for being with us here today. It is times like this I really do miss being in person so that we could share hugs and comfort each other and Judy's immediate family, her husband, Rob, and their sons, Matthew and Michael. The last few months have been difficult for all of us as we wrestled with the reality of Judy's passing. But today, we gather to celebrate all that Judy was and all that Judy accomplished. We will hear from Judy's colleagues, students, mentees, friends, and family who will speak about Judy as a mother, a collaborator, a confidant, and an outstanding researcher and leader in the fields of gerontology and healthcare policy. Judy joined the faculty at the Bloomberg School of Public Health and the Department of Health Policy and Management in 1987. And we were blessed in having Judy as a valued and much beloved member of our faculty for 34 wonderful years. Indeed, Judy and I grew up together as young faculty in the health services, what was then called the Health Services Research and Development Center. I remember those early days and having lots of, of great times with, with um, Judy. I especially remember the daily lunches we had in the doctor's dining room with Sam Shapiro, Don Steinwalks, and Pearl German, among many others. And just imagine, we actually took time out for lunch back then. And then it was not just to talk about work, but to catch up on life. I will always remember those times. As you will hear from the colleagues closest to her, Judy was one of the first to shine the spotlight on the needs for older populations. Her focus on producing and analyzing the data to inform policies to better support the dignity and quality of life of the most vulnerable was a thread throughout her career. Her contributions to the methods of large national surveys was pace setting. After working on the Medicare expenditure panel survey, she became well known for her contribution to the design of the Women's Health and Aging Study, or WAS, a study of older women in Baltimore living with moderate to severe disability. But Judy will likely be best known for her leadership in the design and implementation of the National Health and Aging Trends Study, or NHATS, a groundbreaking study funded by the National Institute on Aging and devoted to understanding disability trends and dynamics later in one's life. You will hear about this study later in the program, but suffice it to say that NHATS led, led to literally hundreds of publications, but most importantly, it continues to shape policy that is improving the lives of older adults and their families. You will also hear about Judy as an incredible mentor, but I will leave those reflections to those who benefited most from her generosity, her tough love, and her valuable guidance. Speaking as the Dean of the School of Public Health, I will say that Judy was also a leader in the school as well as the department. She served in many, many roles, too numerous to name here, but one in particular sticks out as especially impactful. We were fortunate to have Judy serve as chair of the school's committee on appointments and promotions for several years. This is arguably the most important committee in the school as it ensures we recruit and retain the very, very best faculty across the school. Judy took this challenge on with pride, leaning into disciplines very different from her own so she could understand and manage the sometimes contentious debates. And she did so with an overriding commitment always to excellence and to fairness. But I also remember Judy as one who always cut to the chase. I do remember playing devil's advocate with her on several occasions and trying to get her to change her mind about something. She would give me one of those, you have got to be kidding expressions followed by her boisterous laugh. And I knew I got it wrong and that she was right. Above all else, I remember Judy's kindness, her incredible love of life and her good humor. With great fondness, I recall the times we spent with her and Rob almost always over good wine and food. We relished in the comings and goings of our boys, spoke of our love of Baltimore, and as the wine continued to flow, took on some of the world's most naughty problems. Judy will sincerely be missed by her family, her friends and colleagues, but she will never be forgotten. Her legacy will live on through the many lives she touched and the impact she's had on the public's health, especially the most vulnerable. 
Now, before we move on with the program, I would like you to join me for a moment of silence in remembrance of Judy and a, a life well lived. And now to begin this remembrance, we will set the stage with how Judy started her career with this video. I grew up in a town of 99 people way out in Western Kansas. And you know, it was a, it was a big, big deal for her to go to the University of Kansas because it was, you know, it was, four or five hour car trip on the other side of the state. And most of the kids, who, if they did go to college, they went to K-State, the agricultural school. So it was a big deal to you know, go to KU. But she ended up going to uh, University of Chicago because I was going to Northwestern in uh, Chicago and we wanted, she wanted to be, we wanted to be together. We had about, 18 people in the class and Judy and I were absolutely uh, petrified uh, of that environment and we would sit in the back of the room and think oh my god we're never going to get through this. She first went to KU she told me she was reluctant to talk in class because she didn't think she was as smart as the kids from the big city and of course she she was smart, smarter than they were. So that was a big change. She was a big change from that shy kid from a um, town of 99 people out in Western Kansas to national or perhaps an international voice on, uh, on health and public health. We were the first cohort um, that had a substantial number of women at meeting, probably about 25%. Our cohort was very small with fewer than 30. Even so, I think I counted one time there were six or seven people who actually finished and got their PhD. It was difficult being a woman because the, ma the, the male faculty had no idea how to treat us. She um, was really interested in family, uh, family and um, health care. Um, so she's, I mean, she started out that way. Then, you know, she started working on the survey data that they, that they had, and she did deal with family structure, issues of family structure and healthcare. So she, you know, she then went into the issue of aging, um, over, it took her over time until she developed that. I think that really started at Hopkins. I mean, she was always, you know, extremely smart and insightful in her observations, Durkheim and, and Weber and all that kind of thing, but it wasn't her passion. And once she found her passion, which was in the healthcare area, she began to develop a lot more public confidence. That happened fairly slowly but it happened before she left graduate school. Well, I first recruited um, Dr. Casper to Johns Hopkins in 1987 uh, to be the associate director of a commission I was heading up for the Commonwealth Fund, the Commission on Elderly People Living Alone. Uh, so she joined the faculty as an assistant, assistant professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management as well as a, a key staff person on the Commission on the Elderly People Living Alone. So certainly we recruited her for her professional expertise. She was one who forged ahead, whatever the social milieu might have been. She didn't 
I don't think she saw herself as a trailblazer. Maybe other people did. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cheney Fabius. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management here at the Bloomberg School of Public Health, and Judy was one of my mentors. It's inspiring to learn that like Judy, even an uncertain graduate student can grow to become a giant in the field of aging and health services research. When I arrived at Hopkins in 2018, Judy was one of the first people I wanted to meet with. Despite wanting to meet with her, I was nervous. It was Judy Casper. I was interested in learning to use the National Health and Aging Trends Study, or NHATS, and she was the NHATS visionary. What I learned from that first meeting was that Judy was excited about my ideas to examine disparity, disparities experienced by older adults and their family caregivers. We quickly developed a relationship where she supported and pushed me to think harder about the impact and end goal of my work. I am only one of the many former faculty and students that can testify to how committed Judy was as a mentor. Uh, many times when I was tempted to walk into her office, I would see her sitting at her long table her, uh, in her office with a student poring over papers, uh, often data tables, and she spent uh, countless hours with her students. She was very dedicated to her students and also to the, the folks uh, that she worked with, like Maureen, for example. Judy's been a mentor, an advisor, a friend, a colleague um, later on, which was nice to feel that, um, to be a colleague of Judy's. I just have high respect for her. Um, and an incredible teacher, I really. Everyone in my cohort loved Judy. She definitely has given me confidence. I think that, you know, as a as a new tenure track faculty member, I was most concerned about the teaching components since that's not something that I had much experience with. I've always been 100% research. And so, you know, I think that's just another example of her generosity by sort of knowing that I was going to need a little bit of support in this area, recognizing how important it was that I excel in this area for my career. And, you know, and, and knowing that this particular class was a good fit for me, given um, given my background, you know, it was it was um, just a, tr a tremendous act of, of of kindness and generosity. So recommended Judy for teaching award for both um, at the department level as well as at the school level. Um, and so I remember she was super shocked, and she was like, I remember she told us that some of the all, some of the peers were saying, you know, Judy, what did you do this year? You know, did you bribe your students? You know, and so uh, we got a laugh out of that. But I know that my cohort truly appreciated her for all the work that she'd done. I think just her mentorship has helped me be a mentor and encouraged me to be the mentor that she was for me. Just always being there for whether it's students that I work with now or younger colleagues, just that advisee and kind of mentorship has always been really important. I was interested in how, how I was doing as a student, how I was taking the coursework and developing my thesis towards the end of that. And um, she encouraged me always to think past, you know, beyond my box because I was, I tended to, you know, work very quietly by myself. I was a very quiet student. And so she told me, Lee, you don't have to work in a vacuum. Uh, you can always come to me and we can discuss issues. So that was very, you know, um, good for me. I think what makes an excellent mentor is actually pushing people a little beyond their comfort zone, right? So I, I think of, and, and then, and not, and not letting people get away with not doing the work. <laughs> so that, so a little bit of, uh, we know you can do this. So giving people the extra confidence boost that they need to actually carry out something that 
they might individually think is beyond their current capacities. She taught me you can be a researcher and an advocate at the same time, and you can use both of those to impact your work and, you know, in a way, advocate in a sense. That's really been a huge part of that and how she's such a phenomenal advocate um, for those that need it. And I consider myself very fortunate to have had the opportunity to work quite closely with Judy during my time at Hopkins. Judy chaired our faculty development committee in the Department of Health Policy and Management, which is in charge of appointments and promotions and faculty mentoring. And for quite a, a few years, she chaired the school's uh, a and committee too. And these are very important roles because they have a huge impact on the careers of our faculty members. Those things is, is, you know, the importance that, the importance that she put on, you know, deep thinking, you know, she was, she was very quick to sniff out a project that uh, was lacking in depth and really push students and her mentors um, and her mentees to go deeper, which I really think reflects the rigor that she brought to her own work and, um, you know, and the expectations that she had for others, which I think made everybody's work ultimately better. One of the things I also saw her do was to develop and promote younger female faculty and female graduate students. She took them very seriously. She understood the problems that they might encounter um, in an environment where women were not at that point always well represented. So I think she, she really invested in junior colleagues. Channeled being a trailblazer and a, and a, and a woman in science um, into Hopkins mentoring others and putting policies and procedures in place that would help young scientists um, thrive at Hopkins. Uh, she was proud to be one of the leaders of their promotions committee. And I think she saw that as a way to help individuals, including young women, uh, to thrive in their work at she wanted the data to be used correctly and so she was really and she was accessible so you could feel free you know I felt comfortable emailing her um, and saying this is what I'm thinking about doing and she said okay well yes that I think that that way makes sense or she might have a suggestion about another way that um, you should go about your methodology. Or she was very uh... Uh, very supportive of junior faculty and students, particularly those that, that shared her, her interests in, in long-term care and, and, and aging, you know, a very important area and one growing in importance, one that we're strong on in the, in the department, but one that she felt probably correctly that we needed to get stronger still. Just one choice doesn't define the rest of our careers, that there's always doors that are open. And um, that's that's been incredibly valuable advice. It's clear that Judy made a lasting impact on the lives of the students and faculty that she worked with. She was and still is highly respected. She was committed and interested in her mentee's well being and would push you when needed. Now, I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, Dr. Jennifer Wolf. Jennifer is the director of the Roger C. Lippitt Center for Integrated Healthcare and a gerontologist and health services researcher who studies community based chronic and long term care delivery for older adults with a particular focus on family caregiving. Jennifer and Judy worked hand in hand for over 20 years. Thank you, Cheney. I met Judy in 1999 as a first year doctoral student during a meet and greet seminar with HPM faculty. Judy was at that time leading a Commonwealth Fund supported survey of low income older adults with disabilities and she was co-leading the Women's Health and Aging Study, which uh, Dean McKenzie spoke about earlier. Hearing Judy talk about her work was transformative in highlighting to me the importance of understanding the experiences of those living with disabilities when developing policies and programs relating to care and services. I was fortunate to undertake my dissertation research under Judy's supervision 
drawing on a survey that Judy had developed, which interviewed family caregivers of participants in the Women's Health and Aging Study. That experience of working with Judy and her commitment to theory-driven rigorous science heavily influenced my decision to pursue a career in academics, as well as my commitment to gerontology and family caregiving. Judy and I went on to be close collaborators on a wide range of research, policy, and practice activities through our Roger C. Lippitz Center for Integrated Healthcare. Recently, Judy had a critical role in co contributing to the successful proposal and launch of our new National Institute on Aging funded Hopkins Economics of Alzheimer's Disease and Services Center, which I co-lead with Dan Polsky. For the last 15 years, since 2007, Judy and her research partner, Vicki Friedman, have led one of the most consequential studies on aging and disability, the National Health and Aging Trends Study. This nationally representative survey interviews about 8,000 older adults annually, and it is the preeminent data source on national disability trends and trajectories. The study involves a two-hour in-person interview during which participants are asked about their health and function, living environments, participation and engagement, assistance from others, and more. Judy not only led in the effort to establish and, and execute the National Health and Aging Trends Study, but she was the motivating force in leading the National Study of Caregivers, or NSOC, which collects information from the family caregivers of NHATS participants. Judy and Vicki, who you will hear from, had a tremendous research partnership and there is no doubt that this survey platform will be one of Judy's most lasting legacies. You know, the, um, so the National Health and Aging Trends Study, I mean, it is just an incredibly remarkable contribution to aging research and the field of knowledge. And it's something that's going to continue to be giving for generations. It's really getting in depth at questions about what's happening to um, older people as they age. And not just looking at sort of the physiology of disability, but how do older people and their families react? and cope with disability, but doing it in ways, you know, and a level of detail that's not been done before. So that, so it's really going to provide and is providing really incredibly unique insights about how we deal with the problems, you know, that come as older people age and how we make their quality of, of life as good as possible. Judy and I met uh, by phone in 2007. Um, there was a, a competition for a new survey of older adults um, and a mutual colleague suggested we might work well together, maybe. <laughs> um, and that turned out to be quite the understatement. Uh, we worked together for, I think, almost 13 years. Uh, he was my research partner, a mentor to me, um, and, and a friend. I know there was much more depth to Judy Casper's and Vicki Friedman's relationship than like I'm even aware of. But often when people are sharing such big, massive projects, there's sometimes like you get the sense of rivalry. You never caught that between Judy and Vicki. They were both like doing things for the right reason. And they were both fully willing to give each other credit. And, you know, I thought it was both, they, you know, you just sort of saw them both grow from that relationship and both learn from each other. So it was just one of the things like I learned from NHATS was just like watching the two of them collaborate and see how well they work together. To do many of the same things that I had hoped to accomplish, um, create a high quality data collection um, with really strong theoretical underpinnings uh, and a and a focus um, that would yield, which what I think she would refer to as sort of actionable information, the, the so what, the what can you do about it, really meant a lot to her. Throughout her career, she really wanted to bring attention to ways we could improve the lives of some of the most vulnerable older adults. And NHATS, the National Health and Aging 
trend study was a vehicle uh, for her to do that and, and for us, for our collaboration to really thrive. One of the most amazing things about NHATS is how quickly the research is done, the surveys are done, and the data are available for people to work with. It's, and, the, and it's created this hunger in the world out there amongst students and fellows and academics who don't have access to, they're not at Hopkins, they're not at, uh, at Harvard, they don't have access to this huge infrastructure. But here you have this gold mine of data that is available to anyone, somebody where a lone researcher and, uh, you know, in Bar Harbor, Maine, or something like that, can actually look at this stuff and ask important questions because they haven't been asked. And all that limits them is their own creativity. But the numbers of people who are using the data and are publishing the data is just grows almost geometrically every year. It's an incredibly value, valuable resource for looking at um, both trends and trajectories in aging and disability. Um, our tagline really is how daily life changes as we get older. And how it's is used by researchers um, from all over. We have well over 5,000 users of the data right now, um, looking at things from you know, dementia, residential care settings, um, just all, all, across the gamut what she did to make it work. I think one was bringing together people and ensuring that there was a collegial atmosphere in which to work. I think she was extremely good at really knowing who would fill both knowledge gaps, intellectual gaps in a project, but also who could work together in a collegial way and have productive outcomes. Creating a team is a very rare skill and she was excellent in that. She was able to select the right people for the right job, and so that the team was incredibly effective. You know, having been afraid of empowering them, that was, she was good for it. She was selecting people, she trusted them, she empowered them, and so that they became completely involved in the study, the protagonist of the study. And so she created this team that were working together, very cohesive and very effective. I think that uh, her leadership was really a, a genial from this perspective. I was interested in measures related to quality of life. And so I really appreciated both the NHATS and the NSOC. So my impression was that it would be a great tool <laughs> to use to, to answer some of the research questions that I had, uh, especially once we figured out that we could, you know, link it to sort of place-based um, characteristics. We're going to be discussing the impact of Judy's research 20 years from now because she had the foresight to start the NHAT study. And I think what we've learned from that study and what we continue to learn is essential for us understanding how people age disability with age, how people with disabilities accommodate those disabilities with aging. And it also, you know, spurred the, uh, our better understanding of caregiving, right? And, and how caregivers accommodate people with disabilities and, and, and the amount of work that's required of them as well. Uh, out of that came a recent uh, national survey. Uh, we call it uh, Korean longitudinal health aging study. And it's really modeled after NHATS. And it's, uh, it's actually uh, uh, designed and conduct conducted by the National Health Insurance Survey. I actually introduced the team to Judy and they have been having a good working relationship. I think that the, the legacy of her vision for this study will be there forever. I, I think that there will be generation of students, scientists that, that will work on those data and will be able to work on those data because of the idea that uh, really she generated uh, about the handheld study. was powerful. It is clear that Judy's legacy will live on through the strength of the National Health and Aging Trends Fund.
platform, as well as her numerous mentees who are leading research policy and practice initiatives in aging and disability. I absolutely agree, Jennifer. Judy's NHATS fingerprint has traveled across the globe and is forever woven through the literature and aging and disability policy. I remember sitting in Hampton House early one morning and receiving feedback on an NHATS analysis I was working on with Judy. She signed off by saying that she would be happy to chat more with me about the work. I took that literally and hiked upstairs to see if she was in her office. When she saw me standing in her office door, she said that was quick, but she made the time right then and there to sit with me and answer the questions that I had. That's the kind of person she was. She made herself available and wanted the data to be used correctly. Judy's research didn't just focus on NHATS, but on other projects as well. Judy was dedicated to science, to scientific rigor, and to methodology. Working with Judy meant getting things right in both survey design and data analysis. Next, we will hear from our colleagues who worked closely with her over the year. She knew about question construction and item placement, as well as the survey design, sampling design, and the sampling estimates. And so she knew all of that stuff. She always knew when to call a statistician, but she knew all of that stuff, which is very impressive. Very impressive indeed. As rigorous, she was extremely uh, diligent about making sure that every run, every data run was checked and rechecked and that it held up to the greatest uh, standard of statistical analysis. Uh, she didn't cut any corners, but she made sure that the answers to the questions we were looking for were driven by data and honest and solid analysis and not by uh, the desire to see a particular outcome. Dr. Casper was a fantastic researcher, um, and many other people have said this, but partly in setting the uh, conceptual groundwork around disability and the ways in which NHATS was set up to be able to um, look at all kinds of dimensions of disability, especially in terms of um, participation in activities and the uh, person environment fit. She was a very dedicated researcher and she was really an expert in the survey design. So, and how to use the evidence based on the survey outputs to translate it over to health policy. So that was, I think, her main, you know, attribute in, in that she knew how to generate data and also how to use that information to generate policy. Now, well, Judy, one of uh, Judy's strengths was a problem solver. I don't think there was ever a problem she didn't think that could be solved and done in a in a pragmatic way, and you know, working to come up with what the best solution was. I think, like a mentor, she was very careful. She was earnest. She was direct, uh, and I think you know, brought together sort of a nice combination of sort of in my case sociological frames with the data that could, you know, the data that could respond to those research questions. You know, she would take in all the ideas, but ultimately she was very strong in making decisions about you know, how to move ahead with the study. She was rigorous. She liked to make sure that we were doing the best job we could with the best technology we could, with the best analytical methods that we could very motivated on getting the story right, on accuracy. You know, most researchers are, but I think Judy was even more careful about being accurate with the data, with the interpretations, with the statements, not exaggerating and not sort of spinning off in some misleading direction. She was, a, I think, a good advocate for sort of straightforward truth telling. Judy had a real work ethic and a real no-nonsense attitude. I think Judy was the consummate researcher. Um, she was a um, a devil for detail, which um, 
She was a health services re researcher, but had this really strong sociological and socially oriented background. And, and, um, and so trying to understand all of these caregiving and older adult, frail older adult issues from, from the social context, but at the same time being extremely precise around measurement. Um, one little tweak of a, of a word could change the whole dynamic of uh, measurement. Judy was clearly highly respected by her peers and colleagues, mentees and students for the researcher that she was. But research was only one part of her life. Judy prioritized family completely. Judy and I often used our monthly Lipids meeting to show each other pictures of my daughter and her grandchildren and catch up on their latest developmental milestones. When I returned from parental leave after having my second child while we were under COVID-19 restrictions, any Zoom meeting we had started with Judy asking how the baby was. I remember running into Judy this past summer for what would be one of the last times that I saw her in person. I was running up to the sixth floor to work on an NHATS analysis. There she was, masked on, office door open, surrounded by books and boxes. She told me she was cleaning her office. We talked a bit about the NHATS project I was working on, and then we immediately pulled out our phones to show off our babies. As best as we could, trying to avoid getting too close, we held our phones up so the other person could see the, uh, the most recent pictures of my children and her grandchildren. She really loved her family. She was such an, an example. Um, you know, she did, she never really had to spend a lot of time telling, uh, you know, telling Matt and me things. Um, although she certainly did, but you know, she just the example she would set like in her daily life really was, I think, something Matt and I learned a lot from. And I would, you know, those those things were one, um, you know. Find find something that you care about. Um, she, uh, you know, again as as a as a young kid, she was very she was really energetic, um, which I can now appreciate being being a parent of a young child myself and having a very demanding job. She was, you know, when she came home, um, just you know, threw herself in into Matt and me and was, was totally engaged. She, she would do anything for the kids, big or small. However, she was tough. I mean, she didn't, she pushed them to do, to work hard and to be truthful and uh, to be respectful, each other. <laughs> You know, siblings sometimes <laughs> can be pretty rough on each other. You, you know, just like her puzzles, she would always remember her. Uh, you could just pick up the New York Times magazine and she would have uh, at the bottom letters and blanks. You know, it's like she was always teasing out for that answer. Um, she loved mysteries. She loved taxes. She loved That's working true. toward this kind of uh, decisive end, <laughs> a quick wit and a force. And that was kind of, I like the title of this talk as, as Trailblazer because while I can't speak specifically to that in terms of her research, um, I, I see, I saw that in her entire life with her approach um, as a parent and uh, as, a person. as a person. So Judy talked about her sons a lot and their accomplishments. Um, and then, um, you know, as time went by, um, they got married and she talked about their weddings. I remember 
uh, one of her son's weddings was written up in the New York Times. Um, and she was so proud about that. They had a color photograph of the wedding. And I remember her pointing out that um, I think it was Katie Couric was in that same issue. She got remarried and her photograph was only in black and white. Um, so she was really happy to see that her son's photograph was in color. Um, and then, of course, um, when the grandkids came, um, Judy was such a proud grandmother. Um, she showed me videos and pictures of how cute the kids were and, and how much they were growing up. She was very present. Um, we have a two-year-old and a five-year-old. And I mean, she and Rob traveled all over the world to spend time with us as we've been living abroad. And she was really dedicated to those relationships. And at the same time, you could it was really obvious how much she cared about her work and how passionate she was about being at Hopkins, um, about the people she was working with and about the study and knowing that that was gonna help others and people could build on it later. You know, she was very curious. One of the things I think about her life, she was constantly challenging herself to learn new things. You know, she didn't really know how to cook when they got married. She became a gourmet cook. Uh, she loved doing the crossword puzzles in the times. Uh, and the more exotic, the more difficult, she loved that. Um, she loved opera. I mean, she was uh, getting her PhD at University of Chicago. She, uh, it was sort of a stalling tactic. She took a class on opera and she got very interested in opera. And so we ended up going to the operas, not only in Chicago, but then when we came here, she would, she took us to the Met and we learned quite a bit about opera through her. So she had a, an endless curiosity. It's one of the things. And was an, you know, a voracious reader. Anything from uh, murder mysteries to Harry Potter to, you know, Proust. And she even wrote two little uh, books uh, for the grandkids about their life. Uh, down at the School of Public Health to visit my mom. I think I was meeting her at the office and then we were heading home together. And so we got in the elevator to go down together and then my professor walked in the elevator and uh, you know, I said hello to her and, and introduced her to, to my mom and she was just like surprised and taken aback. And I could, I could tell sort of the immense respect she, she had for my mom. It's beautiful to hear the stories from Judy's family that show us that she was also called mom, wife, and friend. We thank you all for sharing her with us over the years. Now, I'm going to invite Jennifer to tell us a bit more about how Judy's legacy will continue to live on. The many tributes we've heard today have underscored the extent to which our school and the broader aging and disability community have not only lost a thought leader in survey research methods and policy, but a valued and respected colleague and a beloved teacher, mentor, and friend. It is my honor to announce the development of a dedicated endowment in honor of Dr. Judith Dellinger Casper to support students engaged in methodologically rigorous theory-driven dissertation research that informs policies to improve care and well-being of vulnerable older populations and their families. As we've heard from the many testimonials from her research colleagues, friends, and family, Judy had a tremendous work ethic. She was passionate about high-quality, methodologically rigorous research and was highly committed to the peer review process. She was respected and revered for her judgment in pursuit of excellence. In the spirit of Judy's career, this award will be structured as a competitively reviewed application process in which doctoral students will be invited to submit proposals to be vetted by an award committee managed by the Roger C. Lippitt Center for Integrated Healthcare. We have set an ambitious fundraising goal, and I hope you will make consider making a gift to support talented doctoral students at our school. I would like to especially acknowledge Roger and Flo Lippitz who have made a generous commitment toward our goal 
recognizing Judy's longstanding membership and tremendous contributions to our center. Donations may be made to the Judith Dellinger Casper Endowment Fund at the school's giving page. In the field for gift designation, select other and type in Judy Casper Fund. Thank you for considering a gift to honor Judy's memory in this way. The scholarship is only one way that Judy's legacy will live on. Judy will be remembered for all the different parts of her, wife, mother, friend, colleague, and mentor. She touched so many lives and even in brief moments of time, left a lasting impression on so many. My mom, uh, she loved to dance, loved it. Whenever I was at um, weddings with her, she, you know, always would, I, 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 she would say, you know, always demand that, that she get a, get a dance with, with me and um, also Matt. Uh, but Judy uh, loved to play the piano. Uh, she had a teacher named Mr. Stern, who was a um, wonderful, older gentleman who lived uh, on the same street that we did, sort of halfway in between both of us. And she took lessons from him, mostly duet lessons for many years. And he moved to an uh, assisted living facility out in Towson. She would, I would go out and pick him up and drive him in here. And then he and Judy would play uh, piano together. For us, and then we'd all have we'd all sit down after, and they'd play for an hour, an hour and a half, and uh, they were good. And you could hear hear them laughing all the time uh, when they if they screwed up or if they did something really well. Her place and and would just continue to take care of him in so many ways. She would go visit him at his um, facility where he lived. She would bring him down back to the neighborhood. And she just didn't say any word, but she, she just came over and gave me a warm hug. And that still, you know, uh, reverberates in my memory to this day. And she was very kind and comforting. And I think for her leadership, the, acknowledging her leadership in being one of the first women, and it was one of the first um, co-PI teams of women to lead a major national study funded by the National Institutes of Health. I would like her work in that respect and her accomplishments to be remembered in that way. I think it's important. And in that respect, having been a model, I would like students to look at her picture and think, I can do that. I want to do that. I want to be like that. I want to move forward and I want to accomplish the kind of things that she did. I enjoyed working with her and I could tell that she was really invested in the development of young faculty and students. She really was. She made herself available and I always say, I keep saying that, but you know, she was accessible and I really will miss her, not only for her expertise, but her mentorship and her openness in terms of being available to folks. It's amazing how many lives she's touched and her legacy truly lives on. It lives on in the work that I do and all her advisees are, you know, incredible. Uh, in that conversation, she told me that um, she thought I was doing a good job as department chair. And it actually was really a turning point for me because I wasn't yet comfortable in the role and her good opinion mattered so much to me. And it made me feel like, okay, even if I make some mistakes, Judy thinks I'm on the right track, then I'm probably on the right track. That makes me think about Judy is to go deep. It's not enough to just get over the bar or, or sort of tell the truth or sort of be on the right, um, have the right message. Um, Judy was really um, uh, someone you could count on for solid advice and to dig into the communities that matter, be it scholarship, academic collaborations, or family. Take from from her life. Uh, and it, it, it's reminded me of something that I read recently by Sir Francis Bacon. He said, begin doing what you want to do now. We're not living in eternity. 
We have only this moment sparkling like a star in our hand and melting like a snowflake. It just makes me think of her. And um, I do we just need to be grateful for what she left behind, uh, a really deep and lasting legacy. Judy was truly a trailblazer. While her presence is tremendously missed, her legacy will undoubtedly live on because she deposited something different in each one of us. If you would like to give, please visit the school's giving page in the field for gift designation, select other and type in Judy Casper Fund. We are grateful to everyone who was involved in the planning of this event including Ninja Tropic and the more than 30 individuals who shared their stories and sentiments today. Thank you all for coming today to honor the life of Judy Casper, trailblazer, colleague, and friend. <laughs>